didn't make any sense. So there's a big article online that I wrote. Now, whether the injury was done before or not, uh, we th we're not going to have all the answers. And I think there's, this is, there's more questions that is uh, to be answered here. And nobody has the final answer. But what we have is one of the most well-known and uh, really a legendary forensic pathologist, Dr. Weck is online with us, and I want to get his opinion. And in the studio, we have one of the most famous spine surgeons, Dr. Sean McCanns, who is also a friend of mine from Mount Sinai, and now he does a lot of work at Lenox Hill Hospital, and he's a co-director of Spine Institute, and he's well-known, and I trust his judgment. So, Dr. Weck, good morning. Welcome uh, to the yes, show. Good, good morning, sir. Pleasure to be with you. I have a lot of respect for you because I have seen you on uh, Fox News where I work uh, w in the past with you, and I've s seen a lot of comments that you've made. So I want to get your opinion about, you know, the, the, they came and they said that this is a homicide and they have evidence to prove that this is uh, wrongdoing by police officers and they have all the answers. As a forensic pathologist, what is your take on this? Well, first of all, I want to um, uh, congratulate uh, you, uh, so to speak, uh, if I may, um, a bit self-serving on my part, uh, for your comment about uh, how the injuries might have been inflicted in some kind of voluntary action by Freddie Gray, because uh, four days ago, I guess it was when I first uh, was invited to comment on this on various national television programs, and they were coming up with that uh, a theory, I said, absolutely absurd. Uh, energy equals one half mass times velocity squared. Uh, where's he going to get the velocity in that uh, van? Uh, six, eight feet of running room at the most, and bang himself. Secondly, I pointed out the no history of um, paranoid schizophrenia with delusions of severe depression or being under the influence of hallucinogenic agents. So what in the world is going to make him do that? After all, there was no heinous crime here. It wasn't like he was going to be embarrassed or be executed for killing 16 innocent little babies or exactly. so on. Uh, so it was absurd. And now, of course, we know that he was bound, both ankles and wrists, placed in a prone position, uh, and obviously he was not uh, uh, running around. The second thing and you alluded to, and I've been frequently commenting on it every time, is I think there's a very strong likelihood that some back injury was sustained initially um, when he was put down uh, by the cops. We won't even get into <laughs> why they were chasing him because he, quote, looked at a cop. Um, uh, that's, that's a subject for another day. But um, they placed him in a prone position, and then when he complained of having difficulty breathing, they sat him up, then they put him back into a prone position, and then they leaned into his back. We've been talking about positional or compression asphyxiation for a long time in forensic pathology, a very famous case here in Pittsburgh. I was involved in with Johnny Gamage, uh, and this is well known. You do not do that. Then when you see him being placed in the van, it looked to me on uh, television like he was being lifted into the van. He wasn't walking uh, in a, uh, an erect uh, fashion on his own ability physically. So I think that he very likely sustained some injury. And then he's placed again in the back of the van, once again in a prone position, now essentially right. hogtied. This was so banned by every police agency in America more than 20 years ago, uh, the hog tying position, ankles bound, wrist bound, uh, hands placed behind him in a prone position, and now he's lying there. He's an inert object. I got to, I got to uh, jump in, and I want to ask you a question because um, there was, as I read all the uh, studies and reports that came as a result of this, they were talking about the fact that he may have been on, on uh, marijuana and also like heroin, and we don't know how much heroin is in the system or not. And also, he was asking for some sort of an inhaler. So as a medical doctor, as a surgeon, the question that comes to mind is, does he have any kind of respiratory problem that he was grasping for air? Was heroin kind of like, was uh, kind of like uh, inhibiting his respiratory effort, plus that he was excited and et cetera, uh, and any kind of pressure on his neck? So what do you look for as a forensic pathologist? Well, what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm anxiously looking for is the autopsy report to see exactly which vertebrae were broken and where the spinal cord was severed. Number okay, so, one, so I'll give you a scenario. So you're saying that he was lying down in the, in the back and somebody with a knee pressed on his, let's say, 
uh, lumbar. Well, uh, well, well, that no, no, not, not I, I doubt that it's the lumbar. Thoracic. My understanding, I, I don't really know, sir. But I, I kind of thought that it's the cervical vertebrae because they keep talking about the neck. So I don't know. And of course, as you and your distinguished colleague there are fully aware, you know, with the C4-5, if you want to stay alive, uh, you've got that innervation coming down there uh, into the heart and lungs, and if that cord is damaged at that point, then, you know, you're not going to be able to breathe. Yeah, that's right. So I said difficult. C1, C2 yesterday on Fox News. But let me go to, uh, please stay with us. I'm going to go to Dr. McCann's. So let's, uh, and you're one of the best spine surgeons, and you should hopefully help us, like, solve this. If there was some sort of, like, a thoracic injury, let's say they put their knees on his back and they, they broke, and which is very hard to imagine that you can break someone's back, but let's say it happened. It would be most of the functions below that level, so he wouldn't be able to walk or he would have some bowel issues or urinary issues, et cetera, right? He's not going to die from that. Uh, that's right, David. <clears throat> if you put a lot of force on the thoracic, and the thoracic's probably a little bit harder to break because of the rib cage, which stabilizes that part of the, the spine. But if you put a lot of force on that, you'd probably break the spinous process, perhaps something more. If you were to contuse the cord, which would be hard at that level, you would have something from the chest down, not affecting the arms, not affecting the breathing. So could there be, like, so you think also that if this is, that's what my research uh, brought me to this, that maybe it's some sort of a C1, C2 from real hyperflexion or hyperextension, I apologize, that could have done this. Is that a possibility? Well, I think to affect breathing, to affect arm, total arm function and make the body go flaccid, you're talking about an upper cervical injury. So C1, C2 is certainly high on the list, even up to C3 or C4. That would be the, the region to be most suspicious of. Correct me if I'm wrong, but with spine surgery, you usually need to have a very high impact trauma. So if you have a motor vehicle accident, that whiplash or fall from the building, are those some of the scenarios or uh, w there are other areas that we could be seeing this also. Yeah, the most common uh, mechanism of uh, upper cervical spine fractures and cervical spine fractures is a motor vehicle accident at high speed. That's certainly the one that most commonly affects uh, people. Um, sports, football, spearing injuries, uh, hockey injuries, the head going into the, the sideboard at high impact, you know, the gymnast missing the rung and falling on her head. Those are the typical high energy mechanisms. Um, but certainly high impact into a stationary object with the head coming down on the neck is a common common source of injury. So, uh, Dr. Weck, as a, as a forensic pathologist, we all saw the video of the way they were dragging him. And so the first thing that comes to mind when public watch that, they say, oh, look at him, he's like paralyzed. But he also could be dragging it because if, if the cops are trying to drag me to the van, I'm not gonna be walking with them and just hang out with them, I'm gonna drag my feet also. So what do you look at? Do you look at, you know, what I'm trying to bring up over here is that it's not as crystal clear, as, and everybody is making the judgment very quickly and saying that, you know, this was done on the scene. Um, and we've seen in many of the cases before, whether it was OJ cases and other things, that a simple, small medical fact can change the entire case. Am I right? Well, yes, but I agree completely with the scenario just given by your colleague there. I do believe there's a strong likelihood, when you put it all together, that some injury had been sustained in that initial altercation. However, there's no way that they could have broken three vertebrae and damaged the spinal cord in that kind of a confrontation. The point that your colleague made is, is to be kept in mind. This is something that we see as forensic pathologists that he sees as a trauma surgeon in high-speed motor vehicular collisions, somebody uh, leaping, falling uh, from a high uh, distance, um, or in some violent uh, sports-connected injury. So, therefore, uh, the as, as reported to us, and none of us has the detailed information that we'd like to see from the operation by the surgeons before he died a few days later, and then by the forensic pathologist at the medical examiner's office, exactly which vertebrae were broken, to what extent were they broken, and so on. But the the extensive damage with the severance or near severance of the spinal cord, that could not have occurred, in my opinion, from the altercation. That had to have occurred as the body is lying there in the back of the van, which that which then brings us to what kind of force would have been needed there. And that would not have just been, as they say, well, they made a smooth ride with those four or five stops. That body had to have been moved violently with the head hyperextending, hyperflexing, as you pointed out, against some um, part of that van. 
and that is what led uh, to the extension, to the aggravation, to the increased severity of the injury. And if, and then with regard uh, to culpability and, and so on, people can argue back and forth, and I don't get into the legal discussion, although I'm fascinated by that too as a medical legal uh, uh, person and attorney, but... Um, there's no way that this was a smooth ride. Um, you would not have been able to get that kind of injury just by his uh, body moving slightly against the inside of the van and, and back to the hogtie position. Well, they, they, when they say smooth ride, they're talking about uh, basically this wasn't like a car that was going 100 miles per hour, and the minute they got there, they stopped, and this was a flying object. I think that was uh, what they were trying to, to, to say. Now, he could also have some sort of brain injury or bleeding in his brain that could have caused this. Well, yeah, but we, we haven't been told that. And, I, I again, I don't know. Uh, I would think, though, that if he had um, brain injury, that would probably have been referred to uh, in the discussion that has taken place the last two days. We, we were told that there was some evidence of an impact uh, of the head against a bolt like object inside the van, which again um, is another aspect of the case to have something that protrudes uh, in that kind of metallic uh, fashion with a, a person in the back. Uh, you know, and if you've ever ridden in any kind of a vehicle in right. which you don't have armrests, you don't have restraints, um, I remember in the Air Force uh, taking a weekend rides on a C 47 sitting in a bucket seat right. <laughs> and, uh, and being buffeted all around along uh, looking at those big boxes that were, were going to fall down on. Me. So, let, uh, you know, let, it's, it's terrible. It's right. Let me thing. just uh, play the devil's advocate and just say that, you know, there was also uh, speculation or rumor that maybe about two weeks ago he had some sort of a spine surgery. We don't know if it's true or not, but assuming that you take the shirt off and there's a big incision, you know, on his back or in front, sometimes I know you guys do the surgery that way. Uh, could there be some sort of a complication of the actual surgery within two weeks after? Some sort of a bleeding or some sort of like as a result of moving him around that there could have been some new bleeding? Uh, do you see that often? Uh, not um, in your surgeries, but is that a possibility? Uh, that's an interesting question. If a, if a patient has had surgery within two weeks and then they, let's say, suffer some kind of minor or not quite a severe trauma, would that exacerbate things? Uh, it's possible. I think Bleeding would be high on the list if that were the case. For, you know, if the blood vessel opens up, that can slowly compress the spinal cord and cause neurological injury over an hour or two. Um, it would also depend on the type of surgery. A lot of the surgery we do are from the front of the neck with stabilization. That would be less likely because that's a very stable construct when the patient gets up off the operating table. However, if it's a posterior surgery where they took away bone and the spine is unstable for a period of time, usually those patients are wearing a collar. In that case, th they might be more prone to injury if they had a sudden flexion moment or Sean, impact. most of the surgeries that you're doing, it's mostly for herniated disc, and these are people that have, as a result of old age, they may have arthritis or the discs are moved and they have like mm -hmm. all these pain mm -hmm. in their extremities. Is that what uh, you see yes. mostly? Uh, the most common thing that we operate on is, is herniated disc in the neck, which compresses the spinal cord of the nerve, and it's bimodal. People in their 30s to 50s get it, and then a different, slightly different mechanism for people in their 60s and 70s. But essentially, a lot of what we do is take pressure off the nerve and spinal cord from disc and bone spurs. And how long do they stay in the hospital? Uh, believe it or not, some patients can go home the same day, depending on the type of surgery. The average is one or two days after the surgery. And then what do you recommend for someone like him, assuming that he had surgery, and we don't know this, but what kind of instruction this uh, patient would have had? to stay off duty for a while, or do they go for rehab, or how does it work? What I tell patients is if they do any kind of physical or manual labor, plan on three months being out to let the tissues heal, the muscles heal, the, the surgical site heal. If it's somebody who does light work, desk work, computer work, they can be back to work as early as one to two weeks. Okay. Um, so that's an interesting uh, information also. Dr. Weck, final question. What is the role of heroin in this whole picture? Could have been under uh, toxic uh, level of heroin and he could have had some sort of an injury, and how would you know as a forensic pathologist that you're called on this? Besides the autopsy, what do you look for? Do you look for CSF, cerebrospinal fluid, CAT scans, the report of the OR? What do you look for to solve this problem? Well, uh, 
first of all, I don't think heroin in any direct way would have contributed uh, to uh, this kind of uh, injury. Uh, secondly, um, they would have drawn blood when he came into the hospital, and by now, of course, that toxicology report uh, is available uh, several days later. By the time he dies, when the medical examiner does the case, nothing's going to be inside the body, but blood would be available from the hospital to be tested. I have seen no reference to that, nor have I seen any reference to any previous surgery. Uh, but what I would do as a forensic pathologist in a case like this is, of course, get a complete copy of the hospital record. In fact, I would want to talk personally with the surgeons who operated on him exactly what they found, then um, and get the, uh, any past medical history, uh, make sure that uh, you, you know uh, any possible uh, predisposing factors, predisposing factors I don't think that there are in a 25-year-old man. As I pointed out, <laughs> we're not dealing with an 85-year-old woman with osteoporosis. Right. We've got a 25-year-old guy with big right. bones, right. Uh, which, again, accentuates the fact that these kinds of injuries uh, are sustained only in a tremendous degree of, uh, of force um, impacting against the back of the spine. So I would get all of those, and um, insofar as what do you collect? Well, you, at, at autopsy, um, you collect blood, bowel, urine, um, you can also get vitreous humor and cerebrospinal uh, fluid uh, and so on. But um, the the specimens that count in this case are the specimens that were obtained uh, from the hospital uh, when he initially was brought in because what remains in the system <clears throat> three, four, five days later when he died um, would, would uh, be of, of no uh, valid relevance. Okay, so it sounds like, and I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth, that you sort of like think that this is a slam dunk and uh, it's pretty much some injury that was performed before he went to the van. And, and um, my, my take on this, and again, I didn't want to like uh, put words in your mouth, but my take is that these cases usually are a little complex and there's a lot more facts that's probably going to come. There are going to be a lot of twists in finding out exactly what's going on. Well, I, that, 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 that's true. But, you know, I just want to say this, if I may. Uh, many people say, gee, um, uh, this is all circumstantial. How are you going to prove it? Well, you know, the recent case that concluded with Hernandez, the football player uh, up in Boston, um, and I'm not in any way defending him, but look at that case. I assure you the circumstantial evidence was much more tenuous than anything here. There is nothing tenuous here. And the people that argue, well, we don't know exactly what happened in the van. Well, then some Something happened before the van and in the van, both of which were under the control of the auspices totally of the police. So if the police want to step out of the frying pan into the fire and say it wasn't the van, uh, then it was in the altercation um, in which he was subdued before he was placed in the van. Either way, uh, I, I don't understand. People say, gee, we don't really know what happened. In, in 80 percent of murder cases, 90 percent of murder cases are circumstantial evidence. You don't have cases in which somebody comes in and says, yeah, I saw A shoot B. <laughs> it's I, not I, that I, way. I, I appreciate your input, and, and certainly it was very helpful. I think you know, the public should be patient and wait for all the answers to come, and this case is going to be investigated.